Chapter 7 The Last Siege of Yucatan Within Yucatan, Korab watches Leoman make the final preparations for a siege he says the Malazans will never forget. I wasn't sure where the big conflict of this book was going to be, and I wasn't expecting it to be this soon, and was immediately frightened that it was about to happen. Lestar speaks briefly with Pearl, but she leaves him. Great time. Hilarious. Loved it. Just uh, a little bit, you know, silly and fun. Fists Kenab and Tene Baralta watch the city walls. A rider has slipped through the camp and rides into the city. You ever heard of two left feet? This army's got three left fists. They can't do a fucking thing correct for the life of them. Captain Kindly and Lieutenant Pores wonder about Faradun's sword. The only members remaining in Hellion's squad is Herb, Breathless, and Touchy. I love Hellion. She's a little surprising. She's actually more than comedic relief. Sergeant Balm starts to forget where he is, who he is. It was comedic, but also extremely unsettling. Oh, it's just pre-battle madness. Just a wild justification. Lutz complains about what the sappers have been tasked to do. Gessler and Fiddler are preparing, worried about the inexperience of the soldiers. Bottle watches the city and does not even see a single lantern burning. This was one of the 60, 70 signs the army had that they should have been like, I don't know, boss. Something's not right. Korab's fears about the night subside. Lorik has answered a summons and come to Yigatan. Lorik showing back up was the last thing I expected and really, really set the stage for how fucked up the rest of this chapter was going to be. Under the cover of Mianus, Bottle and his group of sappers approach the city wall. I don't really understand what Mianus is, but good luck, guys. Lestara Yil joins Tene Baralta. A now drunk Hellion runs into Fiddler, searching for her squad. Battles are chaotic, and man, they're more chaotic when you're drunk as hell. Pella waits for the rest of his squad. Lanterns flicker above the city. Fanatics, Leoman declares. His plan is going to work further evidence that this is going to get fucked up. The sappers blow the wall. This was the shortest Chekhov's gun in the history of literature. You seen this guy crump? Three pages later. Ooh, I'm gonna blow it all. And then fucking insanity. Lestara watches as body parts and stone rain down from the explosion. She's just living her life, and then BOOM! Can you imagine being the star in that moment? Fucked. 
Leoman and the others make their way to the temple. Seeing all of these Leoman parts from Korab's POV where he has no idea what was going on was great and also so frustrating because I just wanted to know what the plan was. <laughs> Bottle reunites with his squad. I love when random mages that we don't super care about at the beginning of the book end up being monumentally important. Love Bottle, great character. Fist Kenab commands more soldiers into the city. We in it now, baby. Streets into the city, Fiddler's squad gets ambushed. After narrowly surviving, the sappers are going to lead their way through the city, taking down buildings. I think at this point, I don't understand why they're like, yeah, let's all just keep going further in. This, this makes sense. Stupid. Not tactical. Gessler has a bad feeling. If there is a narrator, they would say, and he was right. Pella watches another sapper die and then remembers his skin knee and his mother. Gessler watches, then a sapper burns on fire and his munitions explode. Why is this building burning so fiercely? Hellion rallies soldiers around her. This is how I always feel I am when I'm drunk and I need to sober up quickly. I'm like, I've got this, no one can tell. But Hellion actually does it. Sergeant Baum discovers one of the hollow walls of the building has been filled with olive oil. The city is a fire trap. Horrifying, because I've only ever used olive oil to cook, and my head immediately went to, well, I guess a whole army's about to be cooked. Kenib is leading soldiers forward when buildings go up in flame. Then the trenches... The city is on fire. My thing is, why didn't they just leave? Timuel watches the city burn. A third of the 14th army is within the city walls. Great day to be a Wiccan. Tavor orders Nil and Nether to douse the flames, but they cannot call upon the spirits. Something is about to come alive from the fire. Blood magic is best magic. Soldiers are cooking in their armor. Kenneb orders them to drop their weapons. When this started happening, I went from, this chapter's pretty good, to, fuck, this is intense. Balm and his soldiers can't find Kenneb. A fire elemental is being born.
Laird and Sort prepares to die, but watches as sin quells the flames. This was like another Leoman moment to, to see Sin back and doing big magic. Cool stuff. Hellion's squad pushes onward. Hellion is killing it. I can't lie. She said, we're going to go in hard. We're going to go in fast. And they're just thriving while everyone else is frying. Fiddler's squad blows a hole in the fire to escape to the palace. Gessler's squad unites with them. Truth takes all the remaining munitions. Truth runs into the flames. Gessler is held back from chasing him. There's a massive explosion and they escape into the palace. There is like a truth hurts pun, just like it's there, I can feel it, I can sense it, but I can't get my hands on it. In the temple, Leoman intends to escape. Korab is horrified and disgusted. The queen of dreams manifests and speaks to them. The goddess offers them passage, but Korab refuses. Leoman escapes the burning city with the others, leaving Korab seemingly alone in the temple. But he hears the cries of children nearby. We, as readers, are finally on the same page as Korab, and it's really sad. Balm squad unites with Hellions, and they head for the temple. Fiddler is wounded, and Bottle leads the group towards the temple. Kenib is on the edge of death when Captain Faradan's sort and Sin save him. They are leading hundreds, trying to escape the city. Being in Ken Upset at that time was like, kind of like mind fucky. I really liked that part. Fist Blistig is knocked to the ground, and from the city wall, Sin is leading a group out of the breach. Devor stands alone against a firestorm. Again, the fists can't do a single thing correct. So much of this chapter is competent women saving the day. Korab is found by the Malazans. He says Leoman has betrayed them. Sad. Just, just so sad. The remaining Malazans have united in the temple. They use their last munitions to blow the hole in the ground. Bottle wants them to follow the rats. Rats will flee. They are the rats. Blistig watches the city burn, and Pearl comes to speak with him. Dujek will be told the 14th is finished. Bottle follows rats deeper underground. Thus begins... 60 pages of me feeling nauseous. Gessler commands the soldiers adopt a child to escort out. After encountering spiders in the passage, Herb has no choice but to knock out Hellion. The group heads underground. It's perfect! It's a chef's kiss! It's literally like, Steve, you just really wove that in there seamlessly. As Gessler crawls in the tunnels, Truth's sacrifice burns in his mind. The soldiers encourage the children to scramble through the darkness. This was so upsetting the whole time, but also absolutely riveting. Could not put the book down. Fiddler is pulled from a cave by Korab. I mean, to see my favorite member of the 14th and my favorite member of the Army of the Apocalypse becoming bros, great stuff. 
Bottle is caught in a spider web, but escapes. I think Bottle's mind magic is one of the best magic things we've gotten to like really see into. It's not just using a warrant, but it's like connecting with the life force. Leading the way, Bottle finds urns with ancient honey. Cuddle suggests they use it to ease their burns. They begin to hallucinate. A roller coaster of emotions in this one section. Oh, cool. There's this good honey that'll make them feel better. Oh, shit. They're all going to pass out and die. A gut punch, honestly, in this already gut wrenching section. Korab drags the unconscious Fiddler into the shaft and finds everybody else asleep. He puts honey on Fiddler and himself. Korab is a good, good boy. Love Korab. Kenab is healing in camp, and Tavor says the army will soon march. Of all the moments I wanted Steve to let us go out of that cave, this was not that moment. Blistic speaks with the adjunct and her command about the land, and orders are made for them to travel west to escape the plague. Big chain of dogs energy. We just got done this one, this big shitty thing. We have to immediately move. There's something unbelievably terrible chasing us. Nil and Nether speak of Polil, the Queen of Dreams, and Leoman. Just end it. Wiccans do not ascend, we just reiterate, was an insane spot to end that section. What does it mean? Finally finds a now scarred Pores and Tene Baralta, who has lost an arm. I feel like, as sad as it makes me, this scene sort of let me know that Lestara probably bit the dust. Baird and Sort find Sin and they leave together. Girl power. Keneb is rallying soldiers as the 14th begin to march. Underground, Bottle wakes up from his dreams, and then he wakes the others. Glad they're awake, still equally as horrified that they're down there. Gessler dreamed he was fire. Bottle finds a way to try and dig their way out. There is no way to go back. Smiles follows Bottle and sends children through the tunnel first. Cuddle finally breaks the rock open, and a shaft opens to the sun. I was more scared than I had been that entire section, because I thought, they see the sun, but now something's going to go terribly wrong. (laughs) Faradan, Sort, and Sin are riding through the north. Sin has sensed something. They find a child near a hillside wall, and Sin reaches into the hole. There was always still a part of me that was like, it could be a different hole. Steve's the worst. He would do that. Bottle is grabbed by Sin, and she pulls him out of the hole. The sigh of relief that left my body... Upon reading that, wild. Sort begins to dig the children and the soldiers out. Bottle finds his rat and gives it a name. I love Bottle. I love his rat. I don't know. This was like, I guess, a sigh of relief. Everything was like normal. They were out. Gotta love it. Gessler checks to see if everybody has made it out and is surprised to see Fiddler and Korab are missing. He goes back to check 
but Korab is guiding Fiddler out in safe hands. The Korab and Fiddler whole experience is just like when you have two friends that don't know each other and you finally get them to hang out and you become really, really good friends too and it's just so wholesome. Hello and welcome to 10 Very Big Books, a Malazan read-through podcast. My name is Peter Bond and with me today is my friend and closest confidant, India Jones. Hello, everyone. Our producer, AJ Falleri. Greetings, everyone. Salutations. How are we doing today? I'm doing fine. I've got myself a nice cup of coffee. I'm just hanging out on a, a cool end of spring morning with my friends. Back to you, Pete. <laughs> and Joshua, servant of the secret flame, wielder of the flame of Anor, Dean Baker. Tis I! I got nothing else. I just screamed, Tis I. Flame of Anor, isn't that like fucking Lord of the Rings? I tried yeah, to baby, do it's... a Gandalf voice. I'm not that good at yeah, it. Yeah, right? The Anor, I know the Anor is Middle Earth. It's the, th- it's the thing he yells at the Balrog before he tells it, You shall not pass. Um, oh, interesting. So am I Gandalf? Mm hmm. Interesting. I guess. <laughs> yeah. As I, look, I look. I, I was gonna say I look, <laughs> but I don't want that on the record. <laughs> <laughs> and that nickname comes in from Corey. Thanks. Today on the show, we're talking about the Bone Hunters, Chapter Seven: The Last Siege of Yagatan. And that's how I'm saying it, Steve. You can't make me say Yagatan. <laughs> Fight me, okay? Um, <laughs> now. Uh, we just uh, did a bit of a recap. We had a bit of a summary. Just a bit. A bit. We had a scoosh. Just a little baby. Uh, uh, a wait, little scoosh. You might have noticed there was an amuse bouche on today's episode, <laughs> you know? Before we got into the the proper, the good stuff, you know? Some nice little aperitifs. Aperitif. Yeah. But now we wanted to kind of have return to a more our more normal format and have a discussion around the chapter and just talk about our thoughts in a more relaxed way so um where i want to start is with india jones reading habits Hmm. in that often she exclusively (laughs) reads the chapters the day before we're going to record the podcast (laughs) so this often means that we'll get text by text updates about it like the the night before we're going to record the show so (laughs) We had all these big plans to make the show, and I, I talked to Josh about how much he liked the chapter, but then Inge was saying these really harsh things. She's like, man, this chapter fucking sucks. This chapter's boring. I don't want to fucking read this chapter, Pete. And I was like, oh, ugh. I was like, wonder how this is going to go. And then we cut to this morning. Seems like the attitude has changed, Miss Jones. So Absolutely. tell me about it. All right. I want to walk you through a day in the life of India Jones reading this book. <laughs> Let's start two weeks ago. Okay. I went to this with the best of intentions. I am going to be Josh. I'm going to read a few pages a day. I'm going to divide and conquer this. <laughs> and then I sit down to start the book. And I say to myself, this is the first fucking book I've ever read in my life. And I can't make myself <laughs> sit and read this any longer. <laughs> so then I put it down. And I watch Netflix instead. Nice, and nice, this, nice. this kind of cycle just keeps going weeks until the night before. But but the good thing is, is that in those brief periods where I say to my try it, I can still scrape away at at least one third of what I need to read, which is good because the night before I'll have like this is about three or four hours of reading to do. Now, the beginning I thought was horrible. I had no fucking idea what was going on. The Leoman stuff was bothersome. I didn't understand it. I didn't realize I wasn't supposed to understand it. And that was when I was first texting you guys like, this is fucking boring. I fucking hate this. Then Hellion came in and she was drunk. I was like, this is funny. And then I kept reading and I was like, this is boring again. I hate it. 
And then she came. And then then I started to realize what was going on. And I was like where they would, you know, somebody would be doing something and then it would end and then we'd go to someone else and then we'd like pick up later for the same person. And now they're doing something else. For example, when Hellion lost her little her little group. And that's when I started to enjoy. So I wanted I went into this thinking it's a battle and it's only the people that I don't fucking like. This is going to suck. And I don't blame myself for going in with that mentality. <laughs> but agreed. Agreed. AJ said it to me, said, no, AJ, you're fucking wrong. But he was right. Great. Was extremely awesome. interesting and and captivating. And that is what I liked. Um, I was captivated by the story right. like halfway through the half. I was like, what? What? But by the second half, I got into the swing of things. I started to just stop understanding things that I didn't understand and yeah. just really started to enjoy the story. Definitely give it an eight out of 10. OK, I mean, Josh, did you kind of warm into it or were you burning hot from the get go? You know, I like a challenge and <laughs> I like when I'm I like reading and, and I like to, to sort of have to sort of grapple with things. And I really like the Malazan books. But what I don't like is lots of names. I've never been good with lots of names um, in general. I've I'm on the record that when I read, I can't imagine faces. I just sort of have a general vibe. And so the first half of this chapter was really difficult for me because I I was like, I really feel like I should know who you are. I've I'm said that I like the 14th, so I'm sure I've met you, but I don't know who the fuck you are and why, I, why I'm in your POV right now. So that was a little bit difficult for me, but in terms of like this, the moment to moment stuff, I loved it. Cause as I, again, I love the 14th. I really like this sort of very intimate view of the army and especially an army before a battle of this size. I really find it interesting because, like, in book one, our, we're with the bridge burners, this elite unit. Everyone knows what's going on all at the same time, right? And I really like that in this one, we're in a common soldier, and it's just so much of, like, all I know is the specific thing that I'm supposed to be doing, but in the grand scheme, not a clue. And I really like that because as a reader, I feel like that's kind of what how I should be. It's not fair when I always get, like, an overarching view of the battlefield from the general perspective. So I liked it. Aj. I had said in, I think, the first both of the first two episodes that I wasn't sure exactly where this book was headed. And I was really just enjoying being with my friends again. But immediately at the start of this chapter, when I mean, it's the scene with Leoman and Korab or with Leoman and, and I guess Dunsparrow, more or less. And Korab's just kind of there um, talking about the preparations they made for the for the Malzans and stuff. And I was like, oh, this is going to be a big battle because I had known kind of the myth of this chapter that it's like this huge chapter and it's a cool thing and like every you know it's like the best chapter written across the 10 books or whatever and and part of me is kind of sad that i d knew that going in mm -hmm. but also i don't think it would have really it would have it would have made the impact a bit stronger but the impact was still pretty strong but i i, I really did just enjoy this chapter from from second one uh and i did read it all in one day uh off and on i just sat down every and, and read uh a section every couple hours and then that that final section of of going through the uh through the cave was all one sitting um which was just just buck wild i really wanted to take steve on his word and start at 11 p.m at night but there's no way i could have done that but yeah, great, great chapter. Great time. I'm jealous. I wanted to do it in one sitting. I just did not have a spare three and a half hours ever. Yeah. Straight. Sorry, bud. Sorry, bud. Yeah. Yeah, I am kind of uh, bummed you guys didn't have that experience. I would say I have one of the like probably an ideal experience in that I didn't really know anything about the chapter. I was in the, I was when I was reading this, I was in the habit of reading a chapter every day and I sat down to read it not really knowing that it was anything special. And then, you know, like, you know, you're halfway through the chapter. It's like, when, what, this is really fucking long. What's happening here? Like, and then I flipped through, I saw how long it was and, you know, yeah. But I don't know. Mm -hmm. I, I'm sure it's still left to mark, you know? Yeah, I mean, I think there's so much to be said about the chapter. And I, uh, to pick up on one thing we meant, you, that was mentioned earlier on, was about Hellion and some of the humor in this chapter. 
overall, I think the chapter is just masterful in so many ways. But one interesting aspect of it is that there are these kind of humorous-ish subplots kind of in it. And there are these moments of humor that kind of give kind of a, a welcomed beat of levity in what can be such a claustrophobic, painful and panicked chapter yeah yeah i mean it's something that we've seen steve do before right but i think seeing it happen in such a condensed like i don't know having it all be in one chapter is Mm -hmm. just bonkers because like even with kapustan in in memories of ice that whole book there's there's shit happening you know that whole time the siege of Mm -hmm. kapustan and all that stuff um but we get like asides of people but it's also split into a couple chapters so we can like mentally be like okay well this chapter's done which means this part of the story is done so i can kind of check out but for this chapter it's like no 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 you're here you're in this um so those like every every time we came back to hellion was kind of just like a okay (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, it's funny you mentioned kebistan because i think kind of what josh was saying i think this chapter is much more on the ground and personal than mm-hmm. something like Kapustan sure. was. And mm-hmm. I feel much more like I was a participant in this than yeah. Kapus- than, than the siege, you know? What do you think, India? No, I agree with AJ. I think it was super similar. I really, really, I got the same exact vibes from it other than it was just one mm-hmm. long chapter. And yeah. yeah. I, I thought it was complete. I really liked it, though. I thought it was completely. I don't know. What do you think was different about it, PB? Josh? I, I want to say I think the thing that's different about it brings us back to one of the first things we talked about in our opening thing, which is Pella. Mm. Um, that's the difference. The right. difference is we are we are in Kapistan. I really feel like we were stuck with Gruntle, Itkovian. Yeah, I was about to say that, um, yeah. I think the uh, the first, the mortal sword, whatever his name was. Brickalian. Yeah. Brickalian. I think we were pretty much stuck with those three and then the occasional other thing. But this one, we were everywhere all the time. And I really think it's great that um, we can we saw the same squads from different members of the squad. And I think that's what yeah. makes it very different to me. Like, I'm not just seeing Fiddler make every decision for his squad i'm seeing i'm seeing it from uh cork's perspective i'm pretty sure we see it from bottles perspective a bunch i i think that's the big difference for me is that i felt much more like because i had so many povs any time that any one of them was in danger regardless of whose pov i was in that moment like i think the choice to not be in fiddler's pov made me feel like Fiddler could die. I really thought Fiddler was going to die in this chapter in a way that I never felt it Covian or Gruntle would die when reading The Siege of Kapistan. Mm. Like when you're when you're that hard into a POV, I feel like it's very hard as an author to kill that character and and some like it's I mean it's not for Steve. Steve will do it. He don't give a shit. Um but here it just felt so easy at any moment I could just I could just see Fiddler take an arrow to the head the way Pella did or anything like that. That's that's what made it different for me. It felt way more like b- random and chaotic. Yeah, I think it's interesting comparing how many soldiers and this experience of the Mao Marines within the city are focused. But what stands out to me is that. Although there are such a variety between what squads were following, the entire story is not really about them, you know, because we also, of course, have Leoman and Korab and what's going on in that half of it as an important plot line in this chapter. And additionally, what is going on outside of the city walls is also fundamental Mm -hmm. to how the chapter operates in how we're spectating the battle from these fists and from the adjunct's point of view. So I find that the way that we are let go of and let out of these burning buildings and these burning corridors and then dragged back into and dragged further into the heat of the battle to kind of be masterfully deployed, I would say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I agree. The tension and release, as as Peter and I learned in theory one. Yeah. In music school. Yeah, the the and I mean, just like zooming out and thinking about. Just thinking about like a bird's eye view of of Igatan, like they 
it's this big city and then the outside walls start burning and we get closer and we get closer and closer to the center the entire time and our our mm -hmm. pov Ooh, gets smaller yeah. and smaller and the heat is growing and the tension is growing and all of this stuff and you think okay we're in the center of the city it can't get any worse and then they go no we're in a hole now and yeah. <laughs> you are as like pin pinhole sized view uh or, or you know you're crushed in by these walls and by the words of this chapter as much as the characters are. Um, so I really think from like a writing perspective, you know, I don't know fuck all about writing, but I think that is just like chef's kiss to the, the nth degree. Like that is expert writing um, mm -hmm. in my, you know, non literary opinion. Uh, so just really fucking good chapter, really good chapter. I didn't even think about the fact that the chapter literally encircles and makes its way to the middle. That is such, <laughs> yeah, that's such a good, that's such a good analysis, AJ. And the didn't fact that it is it. one big chapter is you are like, you know, some on some mental level feeling like, well, I have to keep going. So I get to the end of the chapter. So it's like you have yeah. no choice but to get closer and closer to the center of this city. And you have no choice but to crawl through this hole with them. Mm hmm. Well, I think fundamentally that what's so successful with the chapter is it sets out to convey the experience of these characters yeah. and it conveys it to you, the reader. Yeah. And it puts you in their shoes and it's so masterful at doing it and it drags you along like them. And that's what's so effective. And I think what leaves such a mark on the readers in, with this chapter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, can I can I quick just touch on. You um, want to talk about the honey dreams? Let's um, rub some honey I'm ready on us, the, baby. I'm, I'm ready, ready for the up. honey dreams. I'm so far before the honey dreams right now. I just quick want to touch on why I liked uh, Pella's POV. Um, okay, sure. Just because, like, for all intents and purposes, they're a character we meet at the beginning of this chapter, and then they die, I don't know, 20 pages in or something. We did not meet them at the beginning Sorry, of the chapter. We didn't meet them, but we, have we ever been in their head before? We've never seen their POV. No, this is the first Hoots. time it's yeah. a point of view. Hoots. Pella. Hella, yeah. Yeah, sorry. I didn't mean meet. I just meant to see their POV. I think was a, this was a first time POV for a lot of these characters. Right. And so we we get their POV for the first time at the beginning of this chapter. And then 20, 30 pages in, whatever, they they die. Uh, and the last thing I think about is skinning their knee and seeing their mom. And I think starting off this siege like that really just sets it off on a good foot to be like fucking awful. Because like... Like we said before in Kapustan, we're just seeing we were just seeing, you know, Gruntle, Itkovian, Berkalian, like these big kind of mythic characters. And to start off with this everyday soldier, not every day, he's in, you know, whatever, but just like this soldier that we haven't ever seen their POV before and then have them die and to just like be a child again. I don't know. I think it just like really... I don't know. It, it, it impacted me in a way that I didn't realize <laughs> until we started mm -hmm. talking about it. So. All right, Inge, what's your derisive looks? I disagree. I thought it was, I, I mean, like, I don't <laughs> disagree. Like, I agree with what you're saying. Sure. And your experience. Sure. But I just didn't care. I think maybe, like, I don't know. For me, it was just like, literally, the thought that I had when he's like, this reminds me of when I skinned my knee and then my mom had to give our money to get my knee fixed. Sorry, mom. Now I'm dead. I was just like, okay. <sighs> That's what that's what went through my head. I, re <sighs> I really like the knee skinning thing, but I'll agree. I did not particularly mourn the loss, but yeah, um, it was a really I thought it was a really cool memory because I feel like that was implying that that's what like literally that one action in their life directly brought them to this. Because if they hadn't skinned the knee, they would have saved up the money to move out of that part of the city, which probably means that they wouldn't have joined the army because they would have been in a better part of the city with probably more opportunities, and if they hadn't done that one dumb thing in their life, they wouldn't be there in that moment. And I feel like that would have been more impactful if it was a character we had ever been in their head before or talked yeah. to. Yeah. But I think that's kind of the point. Like, I didn't mourn Pella. Like, I was I was sad they died because it's a person dying, but I didn't, like, yeah. mourn them, sp per se. And, Josh, I think you're right. It would have had a more, more of an impact if we had known them. But the mm -hmm. fact that... Like, I think it's just illustrating the point that, like, there are so many people who we we know their name. Right. And like, we know the people in this army. But like in, later in the chapter, like four of them die at once and we just like continue reading. But I think with Pella's using Pella's POV in the very beginning is is like trying to set us up to care more about these characters and to and to like, you know, engage with the idea that like, oh, they are people. <laughs> 
you know, like they have whole lives ahead before them that we don't know about. And like they would have had whole lives ahead of them that we don't know about. And now they're just, you know, gone. Um, so that's that. A moment I love in the chapter is when they put together what's going on, that the walls are filled with these olive oil. And Ugh. there's kind of this like sinking feeling. You're like, I feel like the chapter already, there's this sense that things are off and you know things are going to go bad. Mm -hmm. But like we are well past the threshold then, you know, mm -hmm. everyone's mm -hmm. inside the city and you know that like the match has just been lit. If... What's his name? Brum? Crumble? Crum? Crump. Fuck Crump. Fuck that dude. Fuck Crump. If Crump didn't decide to invent a giant explosive, <laughs> would this, like, like what exact, why? Like, was this just like, haha, -ha, this guy who they warned is, did something stupid and like now, like, what was the point of that part for? I'm just, is that what the fire started? Like, is that when the fire started? Like, I... At best, India, I think it's possible that if not for that, they would have made more breaches or a bigger breach. And perhaps the fire would not have been able to cover that many breaches and there would have been an escape. But that that's just conjecture. Like, I don't know. I was just wondering what mm. the purpose of that part was is all. Honestly, I think for me, I was lulled into a false sense of security. Because I thought that was the bad thing that happened. Yeah. Mm. Personally, until the olive oil, I was like, oh, the bad thing that happened was they botched the entrance and now they have a much harder time in the beginning and they're going to get ambushed more easily because they essentially have one chokehold they have to get through. And I was like, well, it's fine now for the rest of the chapter. I know the big bad enemy is, is this fuck up. But nope, it's actually a giant fire city. Olive but oil. Mm-hmm. <laughs> AJ, how do you feel about Leoman? Fuck him, I guess. I like, I understand what his head is doing. Like, he had put all of his eggs in this Drygena basket, uh, only to have it foiled. Um, and so he's really grasping at anything, any way that he can still be right, or that he can still, any way that he can justify the previous means to this prob unprobable end, uh, which is, you know, the apocalypse coming or whatever. So, I mean, it really f fucked up, but I, I don't want to say I understand, but like, but I, 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 I understand what he's trying to do. I don't think it's right. I don't think it's gonna work, but Hey, if somebody promises you a new Shaikh, you got to follow that line, baby. Yeah, like he doesn't even want the shite. He just he doesn't want the shite. You know, he's just kind of doing whatever he can at this point to like escape with his life. Well, escape with his yeah. I was about to say he is he's definitely a coward. Definitely yeah. a coward. He's the Calor of seven cities. That's my <laughs> thought. <laughs> I think Calor though has has malicious intent. I think Leoman's intent is to. I think Leoman is so scared and he just wants to survive and be right. And like do something big and good that he thinks mm -hmm. is good, I guess. And maybe that was the initial intention. But now I think it's really just like help. I need anything like he's yeah. grasping at everything. Just like, he's please let me let me be right. Let everything that I've done up to this point not be for nothing. You know, I feel I, I personally feel like some he is whatever his outcome is, is not going to be good for him. Personally. No, I think it's going to be f he's going to get he's going to get some karma. Yeah. And how are you feeling about Leoman? I feel like like this chapter kind of confused me about him because where I thought, you know, this guy's just really into Drajna and the rebellion. Now yeah. I was like, did he ever even actually care? Or was he just kind of like, was he just like power? I could, I could be, I like being in control. And yeah, this I think that's rebellion <laughs> is what has me with all these cool followers and I can just do whatever I want. And then he was like, this actually is getting a little hot. I think I'm just going to throw everyone away ah. and just go start over. Like, he doesn't really care about the meaning of what he's doing. He just, I think, likes the power of it all. Mm -hmm. So he's so willing to just kill everyone and start over if it means like, oh, this, this went to shit. So, like, it's kind of fucked when you think about it. He literally is like, I'm going to kill everyone, get my new goddess, and... And Korob kind of says it when he's like, you're just going to find her a brand new army because you killed her whole, like the whole army that you had. And he's <laughs> like, yeah. And Lee's mind blowing. The guy's crazy out of his mind. He seems almost to be like 
annoyed that he is a part of the rebellion, you know, and <laughs> mm-hmm. like disdains the idea that he's doing things and he's accountable for it. You know, he's like, oh, well, I burned the city down. But like, did it? Did I really? You know, as wasn't it like, you know, who did it? You know, it just doesn't seem like a big accountability guy is my impression. definitely not accountable. Yeah, I think that's I, I think that's not up for debate at all. Mm hmm. <laughs> He's doing um, it for the for the apocalypse, baby. He can do whatever he wants. But Josh, uh, of course, when we talk about Leoman in this chapter, I would say steadily since House of Chains, Korab has like kind of emerged as a character that we are following. Mm-hmm. But I would say this is really kind of a bigger entree onto the scene. You know, what you what? How'd you feel about following him through this tumultuous night? You know. I've said from the get that I love Korab and that I want to have more of him, and Steve Morab. has delivered. Morab. Morab. Yes, exactly, AJ. So, uh, yeah, I, I love it. I want, I, I'm excited. It's so rare that I feel like a character has a complete change of heart, A, and B, I can, it makes any kind of sense to me. And I feel like Korab has had both of those. Like, literally, last chapter, he's death to all Malazans, and then his leader leaves him. His whole army is burned alive. He meets a bunch of Malazans. They don't immediately murder and eat the children he's protecting, and they help him get out. And he's like, fuck all my homies. Malazans are my new homies. Like, he's <laughs> Friendship like, yeah. with Leoman ended. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> my, yeah. So Malazans good. are my best friend now. Yeah. AJ, can we talk about the honey now? <laughs> sure. Lather me up, baby. Nope. What, what did you guys think of the honey section? I loved it so much, but again... I was like, man, I wish I had paid more attention to who Korok and Smiles were as people instead of just a half-blood Seti and <laughs> the girl with knives. <laughs> that yeah. is how I saw them both. Oh, but uh, oh, stop. The Crump Salamander Mott God is the greatest thing ever. Yeah, did we... Okay, wait. Did we know that Crump was a, was a bowl brother? <laughs> In this chapter... There is a sentence where someone approaches Bottle and they go, "Look out for Crump." He no, got yeah, kicked. Yeah, yeah. yeah, he got kicked out of the Mott Regulars, and the, and to be in the Mott Regulars, you was, well, we don't. I guess there's more than just the bowls. Right. But then he does call himself a bowl later it's when Crump's he's getting not my yelled name. at. I'm a bowl. I was yeah. Like, Wait, what the fuck? But that's which is incredible. Um, I but what I love is that he seems like. It felt like that's a dream he's had multiple times because he's just like, I know what's going to happen when I pull the tail. And so there's like, yeah, but you're going to fucking do it anyway. And he's like, oh, you're right. I like how we're giving Crump this like, oh, country show boy. Well, I mean, yeah. he's, just, had, he's just a good old country boy. Him yeah, and them bold like, brothers. We've had the bold. Yeah, we've had bold brother like oh, southern you twang like brothers. written out. Like, so that's I mean, that's how they talk. That's that's yeah. canon. And I says, oh, I says them marsh trees, you know, like, <laughs> it's right here. I do, I do declare. Yeah. Can we just talk about the Duke of Hazards remake on the show? Can we get that in there? I watched that movie, I'm not kidding, dozens of times, because again, grew up only allowed to listen to country music, grew up with a lot of Confederate symbolry in the area I lived, hmm. loved, I owned the entire Dukes of Hazard series on d- DVD. Love those movies. They are really trying to make Johnny Knoxville a thing then. They were, know? yeah. <sighs> Who was the other character? Was it Sean William Scott? It, it was, was Sean William wasn't Scott. It? Yeah, yeah. Oof. Uh, all right, hold on. I'm trying to find the the honey part because there's there are spots I want to talk about. Honestly, I feel pretty satiated. I could move on. I mm-hmm. just, well, there were some of the dreams. The, I mean, I learned a lot from the dreams. I loved the core. I think the cork one's the best, in my opinion, besides the Mott thing. The Cork one's so good. When he talks about how, like, he's a half-blood and all, like, the full-blooded seti basically became... It starts with an N. I can't think of the word. But they became part of the Malazan culture because they fought with them for so long. Mm. And so the only ones really paying attention to the old days were the half-seti. But, like, it was... I found it really interesting that he found those acts godless because they only... Those rights only belong to the full seti, but they still do it anyway. But then they found their own meaning in doing it knowing that they had no meaning to doing it. I just loved it. I thought it was so cool. Mm. Although the fetish thing was confusing. The end sentence, the fetishes, he thinks, are something wholly else. What does that mean? <laughs> um, I think the... Okay, the one I really liked was was Gessler's because he sees himself as fire, right? 
And they, he talks about truth in there, but I don't think it's it's too much of a logical leap to be like, oh, Gessler's blaming himself for everything because like he is seeing himself as this all consuming fire. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm. And I don't know. I just think that's really poetic and sad and like, uh, you know, <laughs> just makes me makes me upset. The, the dreams were good. I really enjoyed them. Yeah, I agree. Um. All right, let's put a pin in us talking for now and take a listen to some experiences of reading this chapter we got from the community. We'd ask for you guys to send in some voice memos. A few of you did. Uh, So we're going to play a summation of those thoughts right now. Hi. Hey, guys. Hey, guys. Hey, folks. Hello, this is Iskar Jarat. This is Vanessa. Andy Smith here. Blue Jay. Pete. Or Battle Dad on the Discord. Super excited to talk about that chapter. Chapter seven. I've read a lot of fantasy and I've never read anything like chapter seven of the Bone Hunters. I, I still haven't. It's probably the best chapter in the entire Malazan Book of the Fall. Hands down the best chapter I have read in my entire life. What a blast, literally. Incredibly traumatic. <laughs> One of the greatest fantasy set pieces ever put to paper. It's like one of the most visceral chapters to read. It didn't let me go. Steven Erickson jokingly said, don't start it at 11.30 at night. That's actually exactly when I started it. And so I stayed up till 3.30 in the morning reading the end of that chapter. What really struck me was how vivid the imagery was. It was also the the chapter where I actually started to pay attention and really enjoy Bottle, and he is really one of my favorite characters now. The intensity of the experience, jumping from soldier to soldier, and Erickson's ability to make me care about each and every one of those characters, even if they only got a paragraph or two. Obviously, the friendships about all of these characters caring so much for each other, it was incredible, literally spectacular. It seemed like it had a sort of a life of its own, and in a way, it kept building momentum throughout. It just got better and better and better, and just more visceral and intense. The further in, they went into the caves. Just from a pure energy standpoint, I remember having like those heart palpitations, not being able to put it down. I read it at night, just that feeling of um, anxiety and all of that uh, real intense emotion. The big thing that impacted me was Pella and his little narrative in his head as a guide. Um, scraping his knees and going back to being a child was just heartrending to read and is every single time that I read it again. Fuck you, Steve. And it hits you with the literal heat of the fires that the bone hunters are being forged in before crushing you under the weight of the claustrophobia. 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 It's one of the most visceral reading experiences in my life. I mean, it really is something of beauty that Erickson pulled off here. And I don't see how anyone could ask for anything more some of the best fantasy writing, and there's nothing like it, not even in Molasson. I absolutely loved it. That final line, for hood's sake, Gessler, I've never been in better hands. Just so good. Korab is the best character ever. Well, I hope you guys continue to enjoy the books and uh, keep doing the podcast. I love it. Bye. We also received some text posts that were great to read. Dr. Skamufel says, I knew in advance that Chapter 7 was going to be an experience. I planned on doing it all in one sitting, so I took a Saturday afternoon and just sat down and read. It ended up taking like five hours with minimal breaks. I had to change rooms a few times because my family wanted to watch TV. (laughs) I specifically had a huge problem with the fact that I didn't think olive oil was flammable. I also still kind of doubt that, but whatever. All Man oil was, is flammable as fuck. All right. Man all wasn't right. an experience, though. The honey fever dreams are hilarious. The claustrophobia of crawling through the tunnels. The rebirth of the bone hunters. So, so good. And how mm. could I forget Bottle and Yucatan the rat who saved them all? And Crump blowing up the wall. And the tension of Tawar leaving them behind. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Just good, good stuff. Just good stuff. It's a good chapter, y'all. Good yeah. chapter. It's a pretty good book. It's all right. Pretty good book. <laughs> Elder God Jacona says, I just remember not being able to put the damn thing down. It felt like I was under the city with those guys and just hoping that most of them would make it. 
I was not expecting this monster of a chapter either, let alone a sequence typical of the end of a book to happen that early in one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, dude. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Big facts. Uh, we took a little break between this and the first part, and we have 18 chapters left. <laughs> like, Jeez. Jesus Christ. The fuck? What the could what could the fucking book be about that? <laughs> yeah, this is still set. This is still set up. <laughs> Steve said witness. Funny you mentioned Steve because we mm. reached out to Steve if he had a comment he wanted uh, to put on to our special episode here. So, and uh, AJ got to talk to him for a bit about it. Let's uh, let's take a listen. Well, Bone Hunters is an odd novel. It's uh, I've described it as um, two novels slammed together uh, at high velocity, and Chapter Seven is kind of uh, a climactic element to the first the first novel. And I was interested in, um, well, I was recognizing that I wanted the Bone Hunters to go through uh, a rebirth, if you will, uh, setting up for the rest of the series. And so it seemed to be useful to make use of Yagatan, uh, the city. And there's a pronunciation that I bet everybody's got wrong. But anyways, um, as, as their birthplace, because there's historical echoes uh, to Das and Ultor and, and various other elements, uh, seven cities especially, uh, as being formative for the bridge burners. So I wanted to repeat that in a sense uh, with a few twists. But when I got to chapter seven and I realized that I was going to be pushing these characters through the underbelly of the city, it struck me that to make this thing actually emotionally impactful for, for the reader, there was no way on earth I was going to actually let the reader go. And so that's why the chapter just went on and on and on, because just as the characters are crawling their way down through the through the workings of, of the tell, the buried city, um, I wanted the readers to be as claustrophobic and as trapped in there as possible. Um, so there was no letting go. And that's kind of the the impetus and, and the reason for why I decided, OK, I'm going to I'm going to stretch this chapter out um, and nobody can go home. Nobody can close the book and, and, and go to sleep that night. That's kind of the ambitions behind it. So it's 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 there to really push push the reader through, so that what when the soldiers come out, so so does the reader, and you know hopefully feeling as um, relieved as the soldiers are. Make sense? What do you think, Inge? Yeah, I think he definitely uh, he definitely accomplished what he was setting out to do. I I always like hearing things from Steve's perspective because I like knowing. I don't know people. Some people like not knowing what the author was thinking, but I kind of like to know. I just want it. I just want it to be clear and concise. So I like that Steve kind of just like can let us know, and it puts a lot of things in perspective for me because oftentimes with these books, I have a hard time understanding what the fuck is going on. Well, it's great to hear from him, and uh, thanks, Steve, for sending in your thoughts. Yes, yeah, yeah, thanks, Steve. Mm -hmm. I agree. I think he. He laid out his intentions, and I think we've already said several times throughout this episode that that is exactly how we felt. Yeah. So, wait. Just great job. Bye, mom. <laughs> so, keep it, keep it. It's in. Bye, mom. So, Josh, uh, final thoughts on this chapter, and one prediction for where the rest of these eighteen chapters of book six are going to take us. The chapters were very good, or this. All right, this chapter was very good. I. Don't know what else to say. I feel like I've given a lot of thoughts on it. Um, ten out of nine would read again. Well, um, hand me a hot prediction then. My hot prediction is that we're going to leave the 14th. Please give us some Carsa, some uh, Mapo and Acarium. Um, although I do also think we're going to go back to Crocus soon. Ugh. Oh, and this plague's here. So I'm sure that's going to come up more. Plague yeah. time! Unfortunately yeah. topical, AJ. <laughs> Final thoughts. Do you want to offer a hot prediction? Um, I loved this chapter. It was a great time. I would read it again someday. I... <sighs> Steve said this was the climax of the first novel that's in this book. So I'm anticipating a little bit more of a low-key chapter or two in the future so that we get some sort of resolution and some you know calming times maybe with our friends i do think i mean obviously we're going to check back in with all the characters that we've already uh encountered through this book but i do just want to lay down one hot prediction um short for prediction 
Lestar is not dead. There's no way. Um, as she was dying, it said she felt a hand on her back pull her away. Oh, right. <laughs> so, I thought, you know, I forgot that. I so forgot that. Yeah. And so I think if anything, Pearl is pretending she's dead so that they can just like hang out. <gasps> but I don't think she's going to jive with that at all. I had assumed that it was Pearl and then I completely, because the chapter is so goddamn long, I forgot about that. But that would be <laughs> genius. And they can escape and just be like lovers together for eternity. Love it. Yes. Yeah, but I don't think I don't think Lestar is going to be along for that idea. No, 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 no. But yeah, uh, and also I think I think Krupp's going to show up. I think Krupp's going to be in this book at some point. No, so, boo! It's two whole novels, <laughs> baby. We could probably head back to Dur- Darugistan if we wanted. If we went back to Darugistan, I would lose my goddamn mind if that's what this book does. In Jetty predictions going on for the rest of the book. <laughs> oh. <laughs> India just India just looked at us with with uh, a Disdain. face like she was keeping a secret, and then she hung up on the call. <laughs> wow, that was good. That was a power move. Holy shit! <laughs> She's Welcome back. back. You good? And that'll do it for us today. Here on <laughs> ten very big books. Let us know what you think of the show at ten very big books on Twitter and Gmail. And thanks so much for listening, everyone. Uh, yeah, I think that's it. Thanks to everybody who sent in their thoughts. This episode uh, was a lot mm-hmm. of weird work, just like weird structurally. So thanks for being along with the ride with us. Thanks for sending in your thoughts. Uh, we always appreciate it. Cool. And uh, you know what they say. You can't believe everything you hear. When I say come, you say passion. Come. I'm hitting stop. Bye. Hello, everybody. Producer AJ here. Trying to keep it very short today. Uh, I say it in every episode, but I especially mean it today. Thank you so, so much for listening to this episode of the podcast. A lot of work went into this one, including our very own Peter Bond writing the music for the 21-minute recap at the top of the show. Uh, Big ups to him and the whole team. Uh, for this one. If you'd like to send us your big ups, you can do that on Gmail or Twitter at 10 Very Big Books. You can also join our Discord, bit.ly slash VBB Discord. You can also become one of our patrons over on Patreon, patreon.com slash 10 Very Big Books. All of those links will be in the show notes. And not as always, thank you so very much to Scout Wilkinson for making our spectacular special chapter seven art. You can follow her on Twitter at Humble Goat for some DD character smooch sketches. And like I said, the wonderful music in today's episode was written especially for today's episode by our very own Peter Bond. And of course, the wonderful music you're hearing right now uh, is by the one and only Amaranthin from their album Simulant Rain, which you can find along with their other music on bandcamp.com. Links to their pages will be in the show notes. And 10 Very Big Books will be back in two weeks on May 21st, where we'll be discussing The Bone Hunters, chapters 8, 9, 10, and 11. I'll talk to you then. And thank you so, so much for listening. Perfect. Um, was there anything else that you wanted to say about it? Uh, no, I'm sure India is complaining all the way through it, but that's, that's, <laughs> that's one of the best parts. I'm sort of anticipating that anyways, yeah. but that's fine too, because it's one should complain all the way through it. Um, she's right to do so. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it's a kind of an act of cruelty on my part for the reader, you know, to actually do this to them. Mm. But Hey,